A warm welcome to all who have gathered here this morning at Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. This is the place where many of us have found our spiritual home after searching for a place that felt caring and welcoming. Ours is a community of hope and love where there is always room for one more. I'm Kristen Ingalls. I'm a member of your worship ministry. We conduct services in the absence of our minister. Um, Reverend Tammer will return to the pulpit next week, but the pulpit will not be here. It will be down at Stowe Grove Park. The service will start at, at 10.15. So bring your sunblock, your sun hats, an umbrella, and join at Stowe Park tomorrow, uh, next Sunday. Today I am pleased to welcome to the pulpit Steve Jacobson. This service was planned for July, July 8th, but the holiday fire just up the road put paid to that. And knowing the subject of Steve's sermon, I was really keeping my fingers crossed that no other disaster happened before today. <laughs> Many of us here knew what an important part of the community Steve has been. For those who have not had the pleasure, let me tell you a little about him. Steve earned his BA from UCSB, a master's from Princeton Seminary, and a doctorate in education from Seattle University. He has served for a pres as a Presbyterian pastor for 30 years, the last 16 in Goleta. From 2008 to 2014, he was executive director at Hospice of, of uh, Santa Barbara. And from 2014 until May of this year, he was director at La Casa de Maria. He's published a book and 11 articles on the relationship of spirituality to various aspects of our daily life, including secular work, leadership, and digital technology. La Casa de Maria was an integral part of many of our spiritual lives. Like many of you, I have enjoyed their daily, weekly, weekend retreats, the many, many special programs and events that have enriched our entire community. It was one of the, at one of these daily retreats that several of us here at Live Oak attended that we first approached Steve about speaking here at Live Oak. We kind of surrounded him. <laughs> we did. Um, but we, we made sure that he knew that we were Unitarian Universalist. And he said, that's fine, I speak you, you. <laughs> we were all devastated when the mudslides destroyed so much of the campus. And it has left us a hole in many of our hearts. Steve was director at that terrible time. And I would like to thank you for keeping us and the public posted online about the situation and the progress. And I know we all look forward to your sermon this morning. Well, wonderful um, to be with everyone here today. Uh, I feel a connection with Live Oak that goes back a long ways in the sense that uh, when I first started out in ministry in the early 80s, I was in Santa Paula. I was an assistant pastor there, and there was a Unitarian minister named Betz Weinecke who was starting out in that town. So we started working in the early 80s together, uh, and then I was up in the Northwest and then moved back here only to find that Betz was here. So it was wonderful to reconnect with her um, and to share in her, a friendship with her that went on. And now her daughter-in-law, Melita, I've been involved with her on various things in town. Um, so just through that one connection, but also being a Galitan uh, for 26 years um, and having lived in this area and knowing how much uh, Live Oak has been important to this area and part of our community, it's great to, to be here. Um, so I'll, today I'm gonna speak about um, La Casa, and, um, and I'm going to offer this as not only an account of what happened to one part of our community uh, in uh, this last year, but also hopefully as a way to um, have us all c contemplate what it's like. What do we learn from catastrophes and disasters? Um, because that seems to be the, the best thing, as the person said, who when when things happen in life that are tragic, uh, how do we, what can we control and how can we respond? On the night of January uh, 9th, between 3.30 
at 4 a.m. There were four microbursts of rain that came onto the foothills above Montecito. And uh, one of those microbursts, the most intense one in five minutes, dumped a half an inch of, of rain. But collectively, uh, this was a huge downpour within less than 30 minutes. And that, those microbursts, those, that intense rain, fell on hills that had just been a few weeks before burned uh, deeply by the Thomas Fire, which at that point was the biggest fire in the history of California. And so what happened when that rain hit those charred mountains um, is what uh, the story of today and, what I, um, and the effects of it. And the way I want to approach this is I want to talk just very specifically about what happened to La Casa in those hours after that uh, time and then right after. And then a few personal reflections, epiphanies that came to me, surprises in the months that followed. And then at the uh, last part, I just want to look at different spiritual perspectives. And I've had an opportunity to think about spiritual perspectives on disasters. And just think about what each tradition, uh, what lens it sees these things through. So let's get back to uh, that January 9th, that, that night. Uh, as we all know, that Thomas Fire was a major event for us in the community. Um, we were ready to evacuate. La Casa had been evacuated. And uh, we had followed. We'd seen it coming. We, of course, as you all remember, when it started in Ojai Ventura, there's no way it was going to come 50 miles up here. But then those winds shifted and it, it started coming. And uh, we executed a perfect evacuation plan at La Casa that we uh, been um, uh, developing. Uh, we had 100 guests, um, and we were able to relocate them. We took our computer server away. We had all of our important documents, and we, we'd identified those, and we swept them away and put them safely, different parts of the community. And that fire came so close to us, but thanks to the incredible, as we know, the incredible work of the firefighters who stood before that fire and properties like La Casa, uh, we were saved. So when we returned, there was a great feeling of elation of that we had escaped something very terrible. And uh, in a couple of weeks after that, I vaguely knew that there was some concern about some um, uh, folks in weather and geology and things that that fire having happened the way it did, there could be some danger if there was some rain. But uh, it's hard to believe. I grew up in California. I've been through El Nino. I've been through fires. Um, the Holiday Fire up here burned a house that we'd rented in the early 90s, very tragically lost. San Bernardino, the house I, I grew up in, burned because of a fire. So fires, we, we kind of know, and we've had some floods. Uh, and so we assumed, well, it would be something similar. So when we got the evacuation order at La Casa uh, that for this potential uh, mud flow, um, we thought, well, it can't be that bad. So we'll put some sandbags around some of the lower uh, doorways, and uh, we'll probably come back in a day or two. And if it's wet, we'll know how to clean it up. At that point, we had just <laughs> were finishing a half a million dollars worth of remediation from the smoke and ash uh, that our insurance was covering. And so we were getting all cleaned up, ready to, ready to reopen when uh, this happened. But 3.30 that morning, that, those microbursts descended on those hillsides. And then what unfolded is still hard for me to fathom of uh, what happened. But uh, here's the way it worked. Uh, if you haven't been to La Casa de Maria, it's a 26 acre facility. I'm going to kind of imagine it here. Its uh, eastern boundary is the San Isidro Creek. And to the north of it is the uh, San Isidro Ranch, which is um, one of the more premier uh, hotels in America. And south of La Casa is a road called Randall Road. So that's kind of the layout. Well, that, that, that intense rain came down on those hills. And as the geologists say, these, had, these hills had become hydrophobic, which means as part of the natural ecology of the hillsides, they almost resisted completely absorbing any water. So that water came down, and it mixed with a lot of the ash, and it became a viscous kind of a substance, almost waxy, that as opposed to just regular water could, when it got strong enough, could float multi-ton boulders 
as if they were corks going down the stream. So those, that incredible amount of water came down through those charred hills and started picking up a lot of boulders and a lot of trees and came down that creek. It jumped the creek up on San Isidro uh, Ranch, wiped out a few of their cabins, and then came right down um, upon us. And at the top of our property, this northeast corner, if you've been there and if you ever hiked the San Isidro Trail, uh, there's a little bridge there that's near the trailhead for San Isidro Trail. Well, under that bridge is the creek, and under the creek, years ago, had been installed a natural gas main, I think a 24-inch high-pressure natural gas main that transports natural gas from Ventura actually to Goleta, where it gets distributed out. The boulders started scouring and, and, uh, and eliminating the bottom of that creek, and it, it caught that gas main, and first it bent it, and then it ignited it. And a huge column of fire uh, went up in the hills there around Montecito. People that lived nearby later told me that they were out in the middle of the night, 4.35 in the morning when it would have been dark, and they didn't need a flashlight because the light was so intense from this column of fire. Where that column of fire went up, 150 yards away we had uh, uh, orange trees, orange, uh, an orchard of orange trees. And later when we were able to get on the property, the oranges that were facing the creek were singed at 150 yard distance. That was the intensity of the heat. So some combination of that explosion at the bottom of the creek plus the destructive forces coming from the rain and the mud that had been created uh, after the fire started to bring all these boulders and these this, this wall of debris down. As you may know, at some points in Montecito, that wall got to be 15 feet high of mud and debris uh, coming through. So at our property, it came down and it started taking buildings one by one. It took a building called The Loft, which was a quaint old building where many, many AA groups, meditation groups, dream groups had met for many years. Older building, built turn of the century, and then a, a, another building called Bayberry House, older turn of the century. Those were completely erased. Came down to a place called the Hermitage, which had been a piano teacher's cottage in the 30s for the estate that was originally what La Casa property had been developed as. And it took that hermitage away. It came down to the pool, where we had this pool that had been built in the 30s. It filled the pool up with mud and boulders and a four foot high of mud on top of that. It was weeks before we even knew where the pool was anymore. We had just refurbished a number of uh, massage therapist rooms that were, we made them really great. Those completely got swept away. We had a building called Casa Teresita, again built in the 30s, a two-story kind of charming building that was built back then. The top story sheared off and went about 150 yards and it was caught by a chain link fence on our tennis court. The bottom story disappeared. We never found anything from it. That, that wall of mud and destructive, uh, all those boulders and then starting with all the trees and debris came down and it, uh, at one point in the creek, the creek kind of takes a turn and it jumped the creek and so a whole another stream of mud and boulders was added to what was already coming down there. And if you've been to La Casa, you would have remembered the dining room and the patio. Well, that, um, that, that wall of mud came through and it kind of turned and it took all the furniture, it came, burst through the glass windows of our dining room, took the furniture and shoved it through the walls back into the kitchen uh, where we found it uh, days later, the furniture. Filled a lounge about this high, a building like this about this high. And then it, um, took a big boulder and it burst right through the side of our historic chapel. Um, and then all the mud and debris could come into that chapel and it took a piano and floated it around for a while and then kind of deposited it on its kind of an angle in the midst of everything. Anyway, the, the mud uh, had made that turn but it also continued and there was our biggest building, which is about this size, Casa Regina, we called it. And there have been many social activists and feminists and, and people, peace and justice people who have spoken there over the years, built in the late 80s, built to Santa Barbara earthquake specifications, built five foot up from above the floodplain, all these precautions. And it completely wiped away that building. And then our administration building, two-story building, completely wiped that away. All those things that we thought were safe disappeared, excuse me, disappeared. 
And then it kept going down the south part of the property. Some of the debris went over by our residence rooms of three buildings. Um, continued down, we had a wonderful little meditation chapel. Uh, completely, s that's disappeared. We had a wonderful Buddhist garden that we had just dedicated with a beautiful little figure of Kuan Yin, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, disappeared. And all that mud and debris kept going down to Randall Road where it killed two people and, and destroyed eight houses um, right next to us. All of that happened in, I don't know, an hour or two or less. Um, some of the science uh, faculty at UCSB who have been out, came out to study said one of the th really frustrating things for them, there's, there's no video of what happened. Uh, in our video world, whatever, you know, I, so many things can be captured on cell phone, smartphone video. But it was happening in the middle of the night and it happened in the dark and there are no videos. So, to try to, to try to imagine that destructive force without the help of visual images is quite an interesting challenge in the modern time. But all of that happened um, very, very quickly. So we, all of us, uh, it, related to La Casa, all of us living in this community woke up the next morning and tried to start to fathom what was happening. Because of all the missing people, as we know, more than 20 people died because of that event. Um, that whole area got cordoned, cordoned off and it wasn't accessible. Um, but, what, but some news agencies were able to start getting some footage. And I think, let's see here. So that's the ABC News above? Yeah. OK. So that, we, we got on Good Morning America. Uh, we, we got a Good Morning America with an aerial view of what had been destroyed at La Casa. And they, they showed it uh, in the video clip, uh, actually goes back and forth between what had, what had been a, a prior picture of what that uh, property looked like and then um, what had happened then uh, because of the mud. And then this picture, I don't know how well you can see this picture. This picture of our chapel went viral and it even appeared in the Daily Mail of England. So at La Casa for years, we always were thinking, how can we get the message about, about who we are and what we do? <laughs> and so we never dreamed that we'd make the Daily Mail of England, but that, uh, and if you can't see it, this is just a lot of the mud and debris and some light coming in uh, in this uh, sanctuary. The first news story that came, uh, John Palm and Terry uh, got up there and there was one of the neighbors of La Casa uh, interviewed him and he had been there, he was having to evacuate because of the destruction and he saw that fire and he said to John Palm and Terry, La Casa is gone. So the, on the uh, Channel 3 News, uh, KUYT News, the message all of us heard from an eyewitness was that La Casa is gone. So in the next couple of days, it was pretty confusing. Are we gone? Are, are, are we there? But gradually, as uh, law enforcement and fire people get up there and we started getting reports, we heard that a third of our property was, was okay. Two thirds had suffered that kind of um, damage. And we quickly had to capture the story, capture the narrative, as they say. And luckily, there was someone on our staff we'd hired for another job, but she had been earlier in her career a news producer for CNN and ABC back east. So we made her director of communications because we were suddenly in this very dynamic media environment where we were in newspapers in England and on Good Morning America. But our message wasn't going out. So we uh, did those things you do, our Facebook page, which maybe we'd get 20, 30 comments or something, maybe 100 on some other events. Once we posted that we're not gone, that we're there and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna rebuild, we got over 60,000 connections worldwide of people recognizing, uh, affirming, and all these stories, literally, hundreds of people started emailing and sending and calling with their stories of what La Casa meant to them and how important it was for them to hear that La Casa was gonna be um, rebuilt. 
It was six days before I was able to get on the property and it was even then we weren't supposed to. Luckily we had a connection in the fire department who escorted us in. It was kind of like going through a war zone as some of you may remember if you were in that property. All this destruction, still excavating, looking for bodies of people. And uh, to, to walk on that property had, had knee length of boots and it was still deep mud in many places. But it was like a war zone and it was very um, difficult to really absorb that all this was, had really happened. It was one thing to see the destruction of the buildings that had gotten the mud and were still standing. But to see all these buildings, it's like a big administration building, the building this size, they completely disappeared. And as some of you know, there's a term cognitive dissonance. It was like, that can't happen. <laughs> But it's happened. I mean, it's, it's very real. And the creek, the creek had become a canyon. Uh, the creek uh, probably expanded five times its volume uh, and its depth as all this destructive force came scouring, scouring through. Well, we were in the midst of all this, trying to make sense of it on limited information. Um, but as we got on and we were able to do some of our own video, uh, we had a, administratively, we had to decide what to do. We had 45 employees and we had had, had 12,000 people coming there a year. We had a $4 million budget that was almost uh, three and a half million of it was from people paying to come to La Casa. But there was clearly no way we were going to be able to have anybody there for a long time. So we had to lay off two thirds of our staff within about 10 days of the disaster. We showed, we, the Trinity Episcopal Church downtown let us use their fellowship hall to have our staff meeting. And we showed people the videos that we'd taken and they were weeping. Some people just had to leave, couldn't even watch it because how much the property meant to them. And some of the people we had to lay off, one had been there 48 years and another one 37, many others 15, 20, 25. And everybody at La Casa, every role they played, they loved their job because they saw the human healing and hope that came from guests that came there. So it was a job, uh, but it was more than that. It was a real connection to the healing of humanity. And so to be told, you can, there's no work there. You can't, um, we, we have no work for you anymore. It was a very difficult, difficult thing. In the months that followed, uh, we worked a lot with different contractors, the Bucket Brigade, uh, came. I'll tell you one little story about the Bucket Brigade. I know we have a Bucket Brigade folks. Uh, well, right, it's Bucket Brigade, a few folks here that were in Bucket Brigade. So anyway, in that chapel, the Bucket Brigade did a great job cleaning out uh, the chapel uh, with uh, shovels. And I was in and out that day talking to them. And mid-afternoon, I went back to the chapel and one of the guys working there said, um, he came up to me and he'd been um, cleaning out, there, there were six old confessional rooms back when the Catholic Church had private confessions. There were confessional rooms which had been storage for many years because that wasn't used anymore for that. But anyway, he said, you know, I grew up Catholic. I haven't been to mass since I was 12 or 13, but, but I cleaned out that one and I called my mom today and said, mom, I've been in a church and I've been in confession all day. <laughs> <laughs> and he felt that would give her some peace about his, uh, his future. But anyway, wonderful volunteers that came, great contractors who just came, uh, Skipper Construction, some of you may know them, they came and said, we'll start working for you and you pay us when you're ready. You just tell us what you need done and we'll get it done and we'll worry about getting paid later. And our insurance did decide they're gonna honor it as a fire event, not a flood event, so that was gonna open up the ability to help start restoring um, uh, La Casa. And so by the time, I, I was going to retire anyway this year, but I decided to do that this, uh, late this spring when everything had really settled down and all the, a lot of the cleanup was all done. And there was going to be a long period of revisioning uh, that I look forward to being involved in. But anyway, so that was kind of the, the scope of it. And now I want to just mention a few personal things that were interesting to me in my role as director and as just a person uh, living through something like that. Um, one of the interesting ones was about 10 days after I'd been on the campus, we had a meeting downtown at a little office building near Cantwell's Market on State Street. And it was a fundraising meeting, our strategy of how we were gonna be approaching things. And we finished the meeting and we stepped out into this little courtyard 
And I looked down at this planted area and I had a shot of adrenaline and I just jumped like that. And it wasn't a snake that I had seen, it was mud. I, I just, I, without thinking, I saw that and I just jumped. And I, then I thought, that's just mud. But mud had become, in, it wasn't a rational thought, but mud had become an elemental reality of life. And to see that was frightening. And I thought, interesting that my mind now sees mud as a threat. Um, and you can see the way in disasters, interesting, they use, for hurricanes they use names, men and women's names now. And sometimes we'll talk about, well, the fire decided to go this way, or the, the hurricane wasn't satisfied, so it went that way. We personify, I think it's a very basic human thing. We, we, it, it feels personal when something comes and threatens us. I think another uh, interesting uh, fact for me is that my, I would, in the middle of the night, my brain started showing, it had two movies that it wanted to keep showing me <laughs> without asking me. <laughs> One was it kept replaying that first visit I made back during the destruction to see this building and then this building and then this building. It's almost as if it just kept saying, you know, this is really hard to absorb, so you gotta keep looking at this. And I, I would wake up and I, this movie would be playing. The other one that would come at other times was uh, um, imagining me, myself driving into the gates of La Casa slowly at the way it used to be. And again and again, my mind wanted to show me, and, and it was kind of slow motion, and I, I ended up cooperating with the movie because I thought, okay, there's a reason my psyche wants me to see this. But I just went by each of these things, and I think, that's gone. That'll never be there. That's gone. That'll never be there. So I think the, the way our mind tries to help us by looking at reality and really trying to um, encounter um, uh, the consequences of what we're going through. At the same time, while all these decisions were being made and I wanted to be a responsible leader, um, I went to a social event uh, not far from here and uh, there I uh, saw somebody who I've known for 20 years, uh, this, um, who's a, a woman who was a stepmother of a good friend back east and she was a just retired psychiatrist and so we'd gotten to know each other over the years and she came up to me at this event and she'd known what had happened at La Casa and she looked right at me and she said, how are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And she, how are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I think I'm good, I think I'm good. She goes, you need to use denial. Denial is your friend. Make good use of it. And she just stared at me. <laughs> and I was kind of taken aback. And I'd been a hospice guy. I'd been director of hospice here in town. And, you know, we all know the stages of grief. And we talk about denial in life and about how and sometimes we say, oh, you shouldn't. Denial is something you should get past. But she was saying as a psychiatrist, denial is actually useful because it helps you ration out what you can deal with at any one time. That if you try to deal with it all, which seems like the adult thing to do, um, you can get overwhelmed. If I started, when I started thinking, the people we had to lay off, what it meant to each one of them, and then I th would think about any one building and what it meant to people, it would almost get paralyzed. So I thought, I'll be darned, denial can be a friend. It's not something we have to get past. It may be very useful to us. And the other thing is there was a woman there named Pat Kane who um, lives based in Santa Cruz but does work all around the world on trauma and helping communities, um, individuals do uh, work using kind of a combination of movement and Tai Chi and reflexology. She's got an amazing uh, uh, work all over the world. She goes to Afghanistan all the time, the Gaza, West Bank, Rwanda, all kinds of places. So she's mostly all around the world where disasters are happening, wars and disasters. So I had lunch with her when she came to town after the disaster and we were talking and she just smiled and said, you know what's gonna be harder for this community is that they're not used to being helpless. And the third world folks are used to being helpless. And I thought about that a lot. <laughs> in, in our modern society here in beautiful Santa Barbara, certainly in Montecito, people have gotten somewhere because they've, they've taken charge of life. And here's something happens that overwhelms our plans. 
our houses, our engineering specs for how a building can survive, our expectation of, of what it can be. And we are put in, which is actually a very common human experience of helplessness. But because of the culture we live in and our expectations, as she was pointing out, that can be an extra challenge for folks um, who live in the area that we do. So along the way, there were these things about mud and these movies that would be playing in my mind and this uh, thoughts about helplessness um, as we're trying to negotiate and, and do what's right on a day-to-day, week-to-week experience. And having said that, now I want to step back a little bit on spiritual perspectives on, on that experience. Um, La Casa has been a place uh, up until 1970, as you may know, was exclusively Catholic. From 70 onward, opened up to all traditions, no traditions, everything, everybody is welcome there. And so, uh, and I've been a student of traditions uh, for more than 30 years. Um, and La Casa had different sites that re respect gardens and things for each tradition. Uh, and so I spent time in the recent months thinking about, okay, which, each tradition, what lens do they bring to, um, to this experience? I'm gonna start with what you might call a naturalist or even just a scientific point of view uh, that doesn't necessarily see causality beyond what we can see. And certainly from a geological point of view, what happened was not unusual. As Professor Keller from the Geology Department at UCSB lectured in town and talked about, uh, Santa Barbara and Montecito are built on debris flows. They go back 125,000 years. Rocky Nook Park is a debris flow. And at La Casa, for those, 20, uh, uh, those 26 acres, I'd do so many tours in the time I was there. And we had a beautiful two-story stone manor house that was all built uh, of stone, of Italian stonemasons in the 20s. And I used to say to people what I'd been taught to say, which was all these stones were quarried on the property. And then somebody said, well, where do those stones, I mean, after the disaster, now I see where the stones came from. <laughs> that periodically, the way the ecology and the geology of those of our area works is that that happens. That's just a part of the natural cycle. So certainly one perspective is, uh, is, is just that this is a geological fact it ain't personal. It wasn't personal. It was, just, it was just geology that was happening before people were here. Second perspective, I think the first peoples of the, our area, the native people, La Casa property had been a sacred ground for the Chumash people. They cultivated the oak uh, orchards there uh, back in the day. And certainly, I think from a Native American point of view, um, there is a fundamental premise of life which is that we are humble before nature. And that nature, natural things are gonna happen and we, we can adapt to them and try to deal with them, but it would be so presumptuous to think we could ever control or expect them to go exactly the way we wanted. And again, I thought about how um, for the Chumash people living there that had experienced that over the centuries, uh, no doubt knew where to build and where not to build because these kind of things happen, because you don't pretend that you can push it back, you adapt out of humility. Turning to the uh, Jewish perspective, um, after this event, I was curious, and I thought, you know, I've been a theologian, studied biblical studies for many years, and I thought, I never thought about looking at that tradition in terms of disasters before. So I started thinking in the Jewish scriptures, uh, one story that comes to mind is Noah. And I reread the Noah story, um, thinking, okay, does this apply or not? So the Noah story uh, is an interesting story to read if you haven't read it uh, ever. Um, and it's a lot of complexity and archaic -ish elements of it. But of course, the Noah story is based on the idea that, that the people were evil. And so the divine power had to get a fresh start and so caused this great flood that washed everything clean. And then Noah was uh, uh, the uh, element that could rebuild uh, this better earth. And God said, never again will I make this happen. And so the rainbow is in the sky as a sign of that covenant. Well, when I first read the Noah story, I thought, well, I don't really go for this divine judgment kind of a thing. I don't think the Montecito mud flow was a divine act to punish folks. But I thought, and I thought, well, what if part of the reason that this happened was global warming? 
What if part of the reason some of these things are going to be happening more is because we are been not humble, but, but presumptuous about what we can do to the environment. And as weather patterns start to change, and as we all know, fires in California and everything, then it's not that it's a divine judgment, but it certainly is the consequences of actions that, have, uh, that, that we have made. So I thought, okay, well, no, interesting, all right. I had lunch with uh, two um, close friends who are rabbis in town. Uh, one of them is Steve Cohen from B'nai B'rith. And uh, he and I get together quite often. And in the Jewish tradition, there's a cycle of readings that go through the year. And uh, a couple weeks after the disaster of January 9th, Steve was looking at the readings uh, in the Jewish, for the Jewish worship for that weekend. And there's a Psalm, Psalm 97. And it has a phrase in there. It says, the mountains will become like wax. And he said, for years, he'd read that and thought, that's a nice poetic image of, you know, uh, kind of an imaginative thing. And then he thought, oh, be darn, those mountains did become like wax. From a geological and chemical point of view, that runoff with that, what happened after that fire was like a waxy, viscous substance. That's what carried all those boulders. After talking to Steve, I looked through some other Psalms, and I even found a, a, a passage um, in one Psalm where it says the, the uh, oaks will, will twirl. And again, I would think, eh, poetic image. But then I thought about for weeks at La Casa afterwards as the cleanup was going on, all these twisted oak trees were getting um, put onto, onto big bins and taken off. So again, I, neither Steve nor I think it's a divine act, but that experience of seeing mountains become like wax and seeing oaks twirled is a humbling experience. And I think that's um, um, another good theme. In the Christian experience, uh, Cath you know, La Casa had originally been Catholic, uh, and so that sanctuary um, you know, is an old 1955 Catholic-style sanctuary with that crucifix up there on that window. Um, for years, we've talked about changing that so it wouldn't have that image as the primary image. But anyway, this picture, I don't know how well you can see it, but of all this destruction on the ground and then the, the, tr the uh, window and then up above there, the crucifix. Um, so many people said, I saw that picture of your chapel. I saw that picture of your chapel. And I started asking people, I thought, this is kind of like a Rorschach test. I said, what do you see in that picture? And some people would say, I just see the destruction and the tragedy of it all. Oh, man. Other people would say, I see the this, this spiritual reality kind of above all of that. That's what I see in the picture. And some people would say, you know, I see both. I see that in life, there are times of this destruction that we're not prepared for, but spiritual, the spiritual reality, the spiritual um, energy in the world is present to that suffering. It's not disconnected from it, but it does transcend it. So that image has become uh, part of this story of, um, of destruction and transcendence, which is, I think, in our spiritual traditions, all of them uh, is a main theme. And the, um, the, the one other tradition I wanna mention is the Buddhist tradition. Uh, just two years ago, we had dedicated a Buddhist garden, quite a wonderful garden. And we'd always wanted to have um, a female figure, a Buddhist figure there. Uh, and so we were looking for a Quan Yin, um, which as you may know, was a Chinese folk uh, feminine figure that got appropriated by Buddhism, both in Tibet and in China. And um, uh, is become kind of a, often uh, portrayed in statues and things. And um, it, uh, we, it took us a year to find the right Kuan Yin. We kept looking at statues to find the right one that we wanted. And a couple of Buddhist uh, teachers, friends of mine, I made sure they looked at it when we were really ready to pick. And this, this Kuan Yin figure, um, just like in the Western tradition, Maria, Casa de Maria, Mary, can be a feminine uh, aspect of the divine. So in the Buddhist tradition, Kuan Yin represents a, a, a female bodhisattva, uh, someone who has come back from enlightenment in order to be compassionate and help everyone. And the great thing about you know, so many of those Buddhist statues, and certainly this Kuan Yin, is that her head is kind of tilted to one side and just a little tiny smile, you know? Just a little like, I, I figured this out, you know? Uh, I'm not showing off, but I've, I've, I've 
in enlightenment, you know, and as you know, if in Buddhism, enlightenment, a fundamental thing about it is all things are impermanent. We think there's, things are solid, our re personal realities, our natural world, but they're all dynamic and they're all interrelated and they're coming in and going out of being. And so it was such a tragedy when we realized that that Buddhist garden, which had become quite a favorite of many people, disappeared. Um, I thought about Kuan Yin's face, her smile, and I can imagine her saying, but this is what we talk about. <laughs> these things happen, statues disappear. Even these stone statues can be taken away and disappear. Sometime later, weeks later, the bottom part of the Kuan Yin statue was recovered downstream, but still that top part hasn't been unearthed and maybe it never will. But I couldn't help but imagine when it finally is unearthed that that happens, and it's brushed off, Kuan Yin will just be smiling. <laughs> She'll just say, this, is, this happens in life. And for you, it's an illusion to think otherwise. These kinds of things happen. So as I looked through the lens of all these different traditions, I started to see you know, kind of a common, common theme. And I wanna to close today with, um, with uh, insight from my uh, other friend, Rabbi Arthur Gross Schaefer. Um, who's been on the council at La Casa for years. And um, one of the first spiritual gardens uh, that we created in recent years, uh, newer ones, was a Jewish garden. Uh, uh, and it has all to do with what's called the festival of Sukkoth. Um, and in the Jewish tradition, uh, the festival happens in the fall, usually October, it goes back to harvest times. But it's a time in the Jewish tradition to remember that your ancestors lived in the wilderness for 40 years. And they had no permanent structures. So in Jewish tradition, a family would take a week uh, of the year during the Sukkot uh, and build a little sukkah, a little temporary structure, and uh, spend a week out there living like your ancestors did. And so we built a little structure out there uh, working with the Jewish community, uh, a sukkah. And then every October, when it came time for the, the festival of Sukkoth, Rabbi Arthur, we'd gather religious leaders from all different traditions, and we'd do an interfaith uh, service there. And he'd get us all squeezed in, and we'd have put palm fronds on top of the sukkah. And he said the key with the palm fronds, this is an example of the tradition, is that you want to get enough on there to keep the heat out during the day, but not so, f not so many that you can't see the stars at night. So this real sense of protection, but also kind of awe that when you build something. But anyway, we'd all get in there, and he would say, we'd all be crowded together as part of the tradition, and he would say, what we believe this teaches us, it's not the structures that help us survive hard times, it's our relationships. It's not the structures, it's the relationships. And for me, that captured, if I gotta boil it down, it's humility, and community. That an event like what we experience and other people have experienced far worse, and people all around the world experience it, is humility, which is sometimes hard for our culture to, because we want to always be uh, dominating things, but it's a fundamental spiritual virtue is humility. But then out of that humility is this recognition that, that we're not alone, and that we know in times of tragedy when people come to and to support us, how that's almost a buoyant kind of a feeling. To this congregation and to all congregations, the day-to-day, week-to-week work of just being together, worshiping together, uh, enjoying picnics together, that kind of thing builds that fabric of community so that when there are difficult times for an individual or the community, that, that, that network is already there and it can just go right into action. So La Casa now is at a quiet space. It's gonna be, I'm still involved in, in some of the aspects of it. I'm no longer the administrator there. It's gonna be going into a revisioning process and eventually rebuilding. But I think all of us that went through it have uh, been humbled, which is good. It makes us, uh, it gives us that virtue of humility. It's been a reminder to us of how all, all of our traditions really can speak to what we go through. And it's a reminder of how important it is to have the connections in whatever community we live in that can um, nurture us and help us bear what we have to go through. So, thank you. <laughs>